Well, based on the last one, I think there's a, re a requirement for me now to do this as Liam Neeson or my awful attempt at Liam Neeson. Um, so I think I should just retire because British standard. British standard. I'm all mean and today I want to tell you about a particular set of skills. These regulations do not apply to the following install. That just works terribly, doesn't it? <laughs> Can you imagine narrating the whole regulations course? I it? want to narrate the entire wiring rigs, and if you want to narrate, subscribe, and we will do it. Uh, no, <laughs> it's the first time I've ever said subscribe, actually. Dan's going to kill me, because we should really say subscribe, so if you like these, please subscribe, I suppose. Um, right, well, anyway, yeah, let's get on to the podcast, great. and in... <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to another E5 podcast. And this is the start of a very special series um, of podcasts. And I am going to be uh, chairing, uh, refereeing, um, and who knows who will end up on these. But my guest host and lead purveyor of questions and answers is Mr. Hello, it's David Watts, a.k.a. Okay, Sparky Ninja. All right, Dave, let's put, this, let's put the training world to rights. So once we've done mm. this first one, we'll do one with Adrian Davey and a few other training persons from around the UK as part of this series. But I thought I would ask you um, some direct and challenging questions. Go for and it. I'm going to start with one. I've recently been to a college, further education college. Well, you know, I've been to a number of colleges. Yeah, yeah. Loads of apprentices without jobs. I'm not going to ask you to solve the employment crisis. I want to try and take that one on the head. Um what the hell's wrong with the training system at the moment? <laughs> That's an open one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, That's all my questions in one. Oh, God. What do you <clears throat> see um, is good about the training industry? What do you see is bad about the training industry? And what do you think uh, can be improved upon or built upon? And if you want, we can start on private um, training sectors or we can start on further education because for the listeners at home, further education is where we learn our first principles. However, the private establishments, I'm not going to name any names in this at all. Um, the private establishments are where we go to do our updates, our 18th, our 17th, our 16th updates, our design course, our inspection and testing. Mm -hmm. um, and to be clear, from my perspective, um, I don't disagree with short courses but the necessary short courses to enhance your skills develop your main skills and maintain competence the entry and authorization into the industry i do um dave you why don't you maybe just if you want to just warm yourself up and tell us about your background into training and what you've seen is wrong because i know i know you're probably trying to change yourself to the desk and <laughs> well, yeah i mean with regards to, I mean, to answer the first questions about what's wrong and what's good and all that stuff, um, I would say that fundamentally, the the good parts of training is, from my perspective now, a lot, to, a lot leading towards manufacturers and other companies that are trying to offer further development, um, often maybe in the interest of their own kind of technological development because those. The, that training isn't there at the foundation of college, but um, when it comes to when it comes to the problems of training, I, I, I think I think the main the main issues of training really is how the industry kind of weaponizes it and uses it to to um, strategize re, you know recruitment and to strategize um, per, uh, different different positions within industry for themselves. Uh, to explain that a little bit um i'll go through my my personal experience so just, so, just before you yeah. do dave if you don't mind me interjecting um you've made a couple of valid points and i think maybe we'll take them into other podcasts or maybe in this one um it's good to see recently a lot more manufacturers be far more balanced in the way they are um engaging with the industry as in bringing training you've only got to look at the echoes i i put them as world world class in what they do for domestic fire alarm installer safety yeah. their product is a necessary byproduct of what they're doing but their csr corporate social responsibility is fantastic they sell their product well because they win the hearts and minds of people the likes of schneider's helping out further education establishments it's great because they're they're engaging them at a level where 
the learners can understand what the OEM is, what the original equipment manufacturer wants of the product. Um, and that's not a bad thing. Um, well, I mean, I mean, Schneider has actually been my secret weapon for probably 10 years now. They've got their own like Wikipedia. If you actually look for it, you can actually study. Schneider's got such a huge archive of resource. Can you remember the old um, ECA or NICIC technical manuals that we used to love? I think I've still got a PDF copy yeah. of it somewhere. <laughs> well, the 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 Schneider has something like that that is acting it's in the in the online in the online place, but it's like a Wikipedia. And yeah, so whenever is. when we had Amendment One to the Seventeenth, and we had medical locations, then we had the first introduction of over voltage protection way back in the Seventeenth mm -hmm. as well. It was Schneider that always have that clear illustrative guidance. Um, so yeah, again, uh, manufacturers for me are always taking a step forward and always trying to push push the level and the parapet of training the the frustration for me really is actually back at the foundations apprenticeships city and guild qualifications in particular uh I just I'll, I'll just explain or give a bit history of my experience and then and then i can kind of make all the dots join so i got into training completely by accident um it was my said in a couple of previous podcasts i'm a third generation electrician and when we were getting to a point with the family firm which was running at ascot race course at the time the race course was being knocked down it was going to be rebuilt and so our maintenance contract that we had held on that race course for 25 years at the time was it was it wasn't it wasn't at risk but it was going to be slimmed down to a race day attendance and reactive only kind of contract uh which was fine for us because you know my dad had already moved into training my dad moved into training before i did he moved into training at East Berkshire College and he was in there and there was a Thursday or, or a Wednesday night and there was a guy in the workshop who couldn't come in that day. And so my old man said to me, do you fancy coming in? And I was like, no, I think it was like Champions League night football or something. I wasn't interested at all. But he said, you know, oh, you get I think it was like twenty six pound an hour or something for the for the uh, the rate back then just for the sessional training. And I was like, for three hours, I said, what have I got to do? What have I got to do? He said, well, just come into the workshop and just, you know, show the guys how to do some bits on the boards. There's instructions there. And that was it. I had, I had, it was really just a immediate, uh, can you do it tonight? Come in great. Um, so the problem was I went in and I actually just, I showed interest in the learners. I went in and we opened up the workshop we got the rigs out. We got the boards. We had all the, con you know, all these boards that you get with the PVC conduit systems prefabricated. And the guys had to rewire them in arrangement of three plate, two plate. Um, and so the guys would have one or two, or maybe three or four exercises to do. Um, and then we got to the end of those. There was nothing left. And so what I would then say is, oh, let's convert this. Let's convert this to two way. Let's convert this to intermediate. Let's mess it around. Let's be, ex you know, let's experiment so that those who had finished, there was more to do. And I would go up and I would engage. What I didn't know was the actual tutor who I was covering, what he'd normally do was come in, get the tools out of the cupboard, and then he'd sit at his computer and play solitaire and completely ignore them and let them all get off, you know, get, you know, just get on their own, own agendas and ignore them completely. So what actually happened is a couple of weeks later, they asked me to come in again. It turned out the learners had complained about their normal tutor and they'd asked me to come in. So I was asked to come in for the rest of that calendar, which was about, I don't know, about six weeks. Um, and then over the summer, they started talking about me coming in more regularly. And I started the next September. Uh, I jumped straight into level three, level three theory in the classroom. Um, so it sounds like they wanted somebody who actually gave a crap. There was there was definitely issues with staffing. And I think this is one of the biggest issues, especially with FE, is staffing is a big problem. A lot of these places, what they do is they they... They will recruit people and then they'll give them technical training on teaching as they go. So back then there was what we would call the P tools, the key tools, the D tools, which is preparing to teach in the long life learning sector or something like that. Uh, and we do an assessor's award. It's all adapted now to um, TACWAs and things. Um, it's all it's all it's basically it's a breakdown and a rebuild of the same kind of criteria under a different qualification structure. But most of the time. They'd need to get guys in with the vocation to train and they'd then develop them to become a trainer on the fly. And that's technically fine because, you know, you want guys to train who have the experience, who have the technical skills, and you want them to kind of then be shaped into trainers as long as they've got that passion to take it seriously. Um, a couple of years in and there was just, I mean, my own personal problems with the place was 
just the the other the other group of trainers. There's some good guys there, some really good guys, but they had become institutionalized in their own little world. They'd all have a lanyard with a little USB stick with their own training. They wouldn't share. They wouldn't share their materials, their assessments. Uh, it became there was just it was a very it was just a nasty environment. There were two or three of us that would actually talk to each other, but the rest of the trainers, it was a bad, it was a bad environment. The head of the construction section was a, a brickie by trade. Um, and so he didn't really help the situation when it came to actually supporting and managing the electrotechnical sector. There were some people that would say, oh, you know, we need to spend all of our budget on this bit of equipment and the equipment would then just be put in a cupboard and not be used. So there was a lot of to and fro and we found it very, very frustrating. I left that college, though, um, there was one summer and my old man experienced the same every summer come May, April, May, all of the guys who were full time employed, they'd get their holidays and they'd then go off campus. But then the guys who were sessional, who were obviously self-employed, sessional contract kind of trainers like myself, we were then requested to come in and we would be asked to come in. And the, the purpose of us coming in would be to then drill into the learners that hadn't achieved their assessments that year further training further training to get them through and that was the actual wording from the head of construction who was a brickie by trade the wording was get them through and we'd stare at each other going what does that actually mean and so we'd go in and there'll be a guy who needs to be prepared for an am2 or a guy who needs to pass his science and principles and it's a case of right get them through you know, and you, you kind of wonder where that point of where you have to stop and you have to say, no, that, that learner is not suitable or they need to repeat a year or we need to look at the problem because they haven't actually succeeded the requirement to be assessed. But instead, we were just used as tools to retrain, retrain and just drill it into them a bit like, you know, passing uh, training to pass. Um, That's quite frightening. It was, it was uh, again, and this is where we looked into the main problem. The main problem, with, I don't know how the funding works right now, but the problem with the funding back then is, again, every single apprentice and every single learner was a unit of fund. And for them to actually receive full fund, they had to actually achieve a certain level of, of a certain level or full achievement. So they'd only actually get their full value from that learner as a college with the funding if that person achieved full success. And if they didn't get full success, they wouldn't get a full receiver fund. Um, because when we started to actually challenge it and we started to say, you know, no, we, we have to get these guys to come back for a year. That's when it came back that, you know, the funding would then be dropped or there'd be an issue with the funding if we didn't get these guys through. And that's where we just kind of realized that there was this huge issue with money and funding. And basically, I mean, it, it makes sense. Colleges are a business. It's a business, you know. Um, if it's a private business then they receive full fund. But if there is some government funding, then sometimes the funding is in in conclusion of a certain point of success, uh, which does obviously result in some manipulation of the training. Um, mm -hmm. I just, you know what, I think it was today, there's been a national, I think on the, in the media today or the day we're recording this, um, there's been commentary about um, a national scandal around apprenticeship funding and, and a, a shortfall in the money that the government are handing out is being given back um, because employers are not taking on apprentices. And even in 2018, at the time, a guy called Philip Hammond uh, was visiting some training uh, groups with the Prime Minister, Theresa May. Yeah. Um, and even he um, actually said that, that a regulator Ofsted should be given an expanded role um, to regulate the training providers more to ensure the training and the quality apprenticeships is better. Well, it has to be done though, because it does. It does. I mean, that's like, nearly two years ago, but it's not been done. When we come to the question scary. of funding, I mean, some of the funding is supposed to go to the employers. And this was uh, discussed in a, in a post on LinkedIn just today. Um, but, you know, there are colleges that have rooms full of apprentices who have no jobs. So the colleges are tapping into the funding regardless of if the fact that the actual apprentices have an employer, you know, so the colleges mm. are tapping into it. And if the colleges can tap into, if a college can tap into a fund, then they will always sell training. And if they actually have to, if they have to conclude the training to receive the full amount of the fund, mm -hmm. then that would just affect how the quality of that training will result. 
Uh, and, you know, we will see, we will see the scenario where a lot of colleges, and again, this goes back to what I had the experience of, you know, you get them through, get them through this process. I don't understand how um, further education establishments should be allowed to be uh, profit making, for profit making centres. I mean, I, I was lucky in respects of I was the last year, my school year, if I wanted to go to university for free, I could mm. go to university for free. Now it's only in Scotland you can get free university. Now it cripples people to go to university. And now the government, after many, many years of realising, ah, um, we now got less people in universities, we've got less people in trades. So, it's, and I generally think, and probably we can laugh at me, I think it's the privatisation of everything. Everything's goddamn privatised and the government can't regulate over these private companies because they're for-profit companies that will only respond to governments when yeah. it's all going completely tits up. And the government will always seek the advice of the experts who most of the time are for-profit companies. And also looking you after know. their <laughs> industry and their mates. Yeah. Because if they if they create a precedent in law or in a consensus then that possibly will rebound and affect their business. You've only got to look at like, look at the cladding industry after Grenfell. Talk about yeah. closed shop, you know, lots of activity behind the scenes, selling all their old stock, buying each other. It's very, very incestuous. <clears throat> I'm I'm not a fan of certain industries. Um... Unfortunately, that's I mean that's exposure by devastation, isn't it? Um, and we mm. know that you know other industries, if some some level of devastation was to occur, we'd see similar trends, we'd see similar behaviours. Um, it's the training sector is is no different um so there is that main problem i'm trying to stay away from talking about the short courses at the moment because obviously that's another area that i'm very heavily experienced in uh as i carry on my own personal journey but yeah my my experience in the fe colleges was frustrating i i saw i saw learners as, as we said in the previous podcast with michael i saw learners go straight from level three into into training delivering training and they were technically sound but they had no experience but the colleges just couldn't recruit but then why couldn't the colleges recruit because they don't pay uh you know i mean i, yeah, I the see, salaries are awful we see some great we see some great electricians who want to consider an interchange to training but they can't afford to they can't afford to to down you know? i would i would absolutely love and i've said this all along only at the end of my career would I consider going into training because I've looked into it and I would love to have got to a point in my career. I'm hoping when I'm 60, I'll have so much knowledge. I can just help infuse all of these youngsters and learners of any age with all of the mistakes and errors that I've seen in my career to try and help at least advise them and, and give them alternative ways of thinking. But I've looked at the salaries for training. Um, I have considered many a time going into training, but I, I couldn't pay my mortgage. No. To be honest with you, I just <clears throat> couldn't pay my mortgage with it. And it's really sad because teachers to me are the heroes of industry, like nurses and fire brigades and all the rest of it. And there are certain things that should, forgive my language, there are certain things that should not be fucked with in life. Uh, yeah. One of them is nurses and doctors uh, salaries and pay because they knock their pipe out. Um, fire brigade, police, and teachers mm -hmm. without them we have no structured intelligence safe society mm -hmm. and i i just i yeah i find it worrying that universities and colleges will build nice metal clad buildings rather than invest in equipment for their building services learners or and that, and that's and i suppose that's one of the reasons why it kind of it tugged at my heartstrings a few years ago and you meeting you was um has kind of warped my perception in a good way of actually no that's exactly what we need to do. Those support and educate. If anyone wonders where support and educate came from, I'm talking to the man mm -hmm. who, who suggested those two <laughs> parts. And yeah. funnily enough, the man who suggested kind of the direction of where E5 is going to go and a damn good idea it was. Um, but can, can I just say before yeah. you go on to any more, one, on behalf of everyone in the electrical industry, happy, no, it's not happy birthday. Um, thank you for doing your 18th edition. Um, I want to put it in record. Thank uh -huh. you for doing your 18th edition course. It is biblically awesome and amazing. And I have listened to it a number of times and it freaks me out because I now, when I, when I do listen to it, I, I, I found myself chatting with you <laughs> because we chat normally. Um, yeah. And it's, it's really good that you've done that. And I think a lot of people have benefited from it. And also something that our industry doesn't talk about. Um, don't think for a minute the videos that are on these stupid websites of electricians wiping their nose with 50 pound notes. We're not a rich trade. No. There are people out there who are desperate to feed their families. 
and cannot afford training courses. I know I was one yeah. of them. Yeah, no, I um, I have a very firm um, stance on things like uh, organizations that take the mick out of electricians and specifically will always accuse electricians of being the high earners. Uh, you yeah, know, no, uh, things, things like that, that, you know, that there's that there's that company that takes, you know, that profiteers from encouraging people to take videos of themselves on construction sites a bit like the old you've been framed style and their their attitude towards electricians will always be they don't know how to sweep they don't have to clean and they 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 you know they use 20 pound notes to wipe their nose and stuff like that and it never changes uh and again i always think about things like that when i think about the lack of respect for electricians uh again i posted on twitter just last week you know one of the, the third the third key thing i'm trying to achieve with spark and Ninja specifically is getting others to start respecting electricians again because you know the, the respect for electricians has just fallen it's plummeted completely um from from my observations no i don't disagree there is a um there is a level of stu almost if you're if you're a bit thick or whatever you can become a tradie um wrong um, some of the best sparks I've worked with um, were actually not fully qualified because they had, you know, learning difficulties or challenges, um, but they were still great installers, still great thinkers. They, you know, I'm, I hate to say this, but I, so I work, I work in an industry now where I go into sites and I go into meetings in London, I wear a shirt and tie and everyone talks about BIM, BIM integration, <laughs> BIM modeling and 3D modeling and, and all of this good stuff. And it all becomes a chess game between people wanting more money to increase their profit margins. And I sit there and I go, hmm, great. How does the installer interpret all this? And then I have to sit there and, and when I ask that question, because I do, because I'm a taxpayer mm. and I always want value for money. And a lot of people seem to forget that when at work. You know, what your money you're spending is the fair payer and the taxpayer money. And I never do. And I've sat in meetings where I've gone, that's great. This is really nice, the digital stuff. But um, when I'm a spark, all I need is a drawing that gives me suitable information to tell me what height you want it, how you want it fixed, the, the detailing of what fixing you want, the reasoning behind it, because I found good designs actually educate people. Good specifications yeah. educate people. And that helps, I've found, sparks go from standard to standard on jobs. I mean, I've actually had sparks come up to me and go, excuse me, but I was working at the British Library. And I'm going, yeah, standard was much better then. This is what we did. No, I've gone great, fantastic. Do that. But really? again, I mean, this industry used to have a certain level of craft. Yes. You know, uh, I remember, I remember uh, when I was really, really fresh in the industry, I'd be struggling to to you know thread the conduit to get the proper bend bubble set or whatever. And my my old granddad would adjust something instead of actually getting it on all the right rigs. He would go to an oak tree or a drain. And he would just do a couple of little things with it and it would be immaculate. You know, he had this way of just handling conduits and actually manipulating the gear just from constant, constant experience. And he was really, really, really consistent with uh, workmanship. You know, there was a craft in the trade. And this, I, I, this is why I've tried to get involved more with the, um, the competitions like, you know, Prince of the Year with Sparks Magazine, trying to obviously help out to promote like, things like um, world skills and things, because we need to give apprentices the opportunity to compete and to de demonstrate these skills and celebrate those that actually do perform uh, what we would consider as to a, a quality craft as well. It's not just the technical knowledge. We've got to obviously collect and celebrate great performance of these skills. Uh, unfortunately, back go, going back to FE colleges, there was, you know, as you've seen now, there's just insufficient resources. This is insufficient time. A lot of the time, the workshop is kind of, um, it's treated as a second part of the training journey in FE colleges, where you'll grind some practical skills. There'll be a workshop technician there who will obviously keep a safe work environment, but they may not possess themselves experience from the site. Mm. You know, they may not have the experience to then bring the workplace in. Many colleges just have a technician chap who's in the workshop. It's not always well, the same. I'll be honest with you, the first time I started going to colleges, I'm not going to lie, I was mortified by what I saw mm. because it was it was in a worse state than I remember at Tottenham College. When I went to Tottenham College, there was two Jamaicans. Got One of them was Desmond. I'm pretty sure it was Desmond. I can't remember the other chap's name. Um Carl, Desmond and Carl, and they were in the workshop. And when you went to get tools, you didn't know what you were doing. You were basically told, here's your job sheet. 
go and do. And you'd walk yeah. up to them and you'd say, excuse me, I need to do this. And they'd just literally kiss the teeth and tell you to go away until you did a takeoff. Mm-hmm. And then you'd walk away and you'd go, oh, what's a takeoff? And it was all part, everything, every engagement was a learning activity. And then they'd eventually go, you need to schedule out the materials you need to do in a list because when you're on site, if you don't, you're losing time. Time is money. And that's a key, that is a key thing as well because if you can spend like the whole two, uh, two and a half hour afternoon session doing a bubble set, great. But if you've got a guy that's going to say, now do that in 10 minutes. Yep. You know, grind it until you get that perfect because in the real site, you're going to have to do that a lot quicker than that. You know, yep. a lot of colleges don't do that. It's like, have you done that? Great. Tick. Here's the next thing. Tick. Here's the next thing. Tick. Instead of, all oh, right. Well, they were, you know, do it better. Or even things like less waste or work tidier. You know, there was lot, times lot. where we didn't do practical skills because they didn't have the budgets or the cables. No. And there were times where we'd have like pyro. We didn't do pyro. We had the tutor do pyro and show us it. And then we would get a tiny, like 12 inch length of it. And we'd get one <laughs> shot to strip it and measure it. And that was it because they were so skint. They were so broke. I really hope if anyone from Tottenham college is listening, it's not called Tottenham college. Now it was the college in North East London. I think they've hipped it and made it Conell yeah or the college of north and east london or something like that but it was Cornell or web it, it was a bit like that where where i was so we actually from from our own stores we got some mi that we had from the race course we brought it in and we actually then terminated it we got the lads to terminate then we put some water in it yeah and then we got the old hot the old blow touch on it to dry it out and then we hit it with a hammer we're just measuring and seeing how strong that cable was so there's a note to anybody if you're on a job and you use any pyro or mineral insulated copper core or copper conductor depending on how you were taught um if you've got any spare or, or an off cut of 50 odd meters do yeah. do the world a favor take it to your local fe college and give it to them i'm sure they'll gratefully receive it if, um, they, if they say they don't need it let me shout them that they do tell them they do and tell them to re- yeah exactly yeah. keep keep a tradition and a skill because pyro is the best cable there is and it's mm-hmm. the hardest and it took the most skill same um, with your tools but, yeah i've still got two sets actually in my toolbox i need to give them away um but okay so i went to further edu- so i visited a lot of further education establishment i was mortified because i expected um i went on a journey of 20 years to become a client uh, everyone's going to moan and say he's just said he's a client again sorry um <laughs> sorry and um i expect guys now to come out of college far smarter than me um and yet they're still working on the same bloody equipment the what do you call it swiss cheese the cheese balls whatever yeah. um the same equipment that was sitting there 20 years ago and 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 funding is ever even more tight and yet you know you speak to tutors and they're having to build rigs themselves they're literally going in in evenings and weekends and building new rigs and new setups to meet the demands of these new courses on shoestrings, reusing old stuff. And and this is why we're trying to do more to raise awareness of what can we do for further education? OK, we can't turn up in a bus and put them all on YouTube um, because they don't want that. But what we can do is um, ask manufacturers if they've got any kind, you know, um, old stock or, or stock that is um you know going spare for charitable or or, or and, and direct it in the in the direction of f- uh, further education now the private sectors um i'm sorry but your private companies are make a hell of a lot more money and i'm going to use an example of warrington when i was there with the iet doing event talking about competency um it was quite humbling i've been up there three times dave does amazing work with uh, a lot of constraints on him and it's been really a pleasure to help him and work with him but when we were there, one of when we did a Q and A, one of the learners turned around and said, "Why am I sat here for three years when one of my best friends is across the road at a training centre? I'm not mentioning the 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 name or the acronym, um, and he can learn to do this in five weeks on the latest technology, the latest boards, and everything else." And that was the thing that made me so angry. Um, that we literally got on the phone to Schneider and said, look, please tell me you've got some spare kit lying around that these learners can have. And in fairness, Schneider have just, well, we love Schneider. We've got a lot of time for Schneider. We do. And we're going to be doing a bit with Schneider, hopefully at some point in the future. But there's a spoiler. Um, and, and it was great. It's great to see him helping FEs. But I'm sorry, but private private companies, for all the profits they make, you should facilitate the training that you're doing and all the necessary features. Um if you're going private, you've evidently got the money. Now, actually, no, that's probably the wrong thing to say because there are also some people break the bank 
to try and this is the curse of the short course isn't it some people will take out loans to do the short courses because they're being sold a dream dave would you want to sell that dream in the industry go for it <laughs> uh no uh, what what i'm hoping to do is obviously recognize i i, I did this um, I, I responded to a post uh, craig put up earlier on because he put a post on linkedin saying you know people try oh, and craig o'neill yeah trying so trying so desperately hard to get onto the onto the ladder it's no wonder people are going down the quick route spending a bigger lung for change first of all but getting quickly into that that into that higher income market instead of going on a what could be a three-year journey or so on a lower wage and it's completely understandable you know we have evolved into a society that wants instant on-demand television we don't want to queue up at the tills anymore we want things quick we want things now and young lads young girls in particular on their phones and the things are used to things being quick and instant and when they go to a college they don't want to sit into the same three-year four-year structure that's been repeated and repeated and repeated for 10 15 20 years with powerpoint presentations and all that stuff we do need to start re-innovating training uh but obviously finding ways that can meet that meet the more modern method of learning whether it be you know like things like this podcast to, to assist exhibitions e-learning or whatever um but giving people the ability to i think i, I do honestly think because a lot of these a lot of these short companies what they do is they they'll take your money then they'll give you a manual they'll give you a binder of self-learning and you're out on your own and if you email the tutor he'll give you a 24-hour turnover for a response there's no personal one-on-one -on -one engagement people want to learn that way though they want to jump in consume as much as they can and they want to they want to binge learn um this isn't going to work uh, you're not going to develop competency that way no but if we can find ways to provide like we have with short courses people are happy to go and they can pass technical assessments we can we can do that but what we need to do is have a structure that can still assist a gradual development of competence uh if we sit them in front of a classroom of a powerpoint presentation have three years of this then they're going to look across the road see a training center that will say five weeks of this and they're going i'm to go so away. glad when i was learning powerpoint was a uh, probably a dream in some developers eye um yeah. just on that craig o'neill god bless him um hello craig <laughs> and we will have you on these podcasts at some point have you, have you gonna, found the post I'm, i found it i'm reading it now did you see so, my reply um i haven't yet i'm just going to read uh, his post though he says one of my students has decided to do a short course instead of completing an apprenticeship now from my perspective big mistake pal you're going to regret that i didn't get the chance to warn him of the implications he wasn't in the class for long at all but still has hit, it has hit me hard craig is a very emotional man who genuinely i love the fact that in my last few years of my career i've met some of the most passionate caring teachers and trainers and they are so frustrated and i'm sure if they got put in front of an M a load of mps they would lock the doors and shake sense <laughs> into them because they put their hearts and souls into it yep. so He's then put, I feel like I failed him. I want to talk to him, but must respect his wishes. It got me thinking about the decline in our industry. Is it real? Yeah. What is important to a young man or woman today? The chance of owning a home and starting a family is a pipe dream for most due to the insane cost. So what are people simply doing to survive? Is there a faster way to get more money? Is it their fault that these options are more appealing? Is it the problem of our economy? And should we stop blaming industry leaders and look at society as a whole? Do you know what? I think society has definitely contributed the quick wins, the 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 lifestyles, um, mm -hmm. it's incredible. And what, what? Let's see what your response. Oh, you've responded. You're suggesting that as houses are harder to buy, it's justified for all industries to rush people to the front line themselves, cashing in in the process. Young men and women want things a lot more immediately. Retail, entertainment, leisure. Uh, the more stages there are in any process, the more frustrating it becomes. Training companies and voluntary industry bodies have cashed in on this for far too long. I yeah i do agree we have to either accept this standard or seek to improve it well i think we're trying to uh, it's never the learner's fault we can't rush competence and that's the thing uh, what we can do is evolve our methods classrooms and powerpoints are boring i like to use powerpoint as a visual indicator and, mm -hmm. and you taught me that yeah because my first powerpoint was rubbish and you told me it was rubbish thank you <laughs> um 
Honest feedback is good. Uh, Three-year training courses seem too much in the mix of things. This is why you're trying to do your Sparky Ninja stuff, um, streaming, exhibits, podcasts. Learners can binge on training and return to it. And do you know what I always say to people? The knowledge is there. Just go and find it at your time, mm. in your lunch break, whenever you want. It's a fantastically adaptable tool. And putting free knowledge out there is a threat to business models. Well, guess what? Business models should be threatened. It should be, yeah. Because unless they're going to do something that contributes to an upskilling and also a common message, and I think the industry needs to have a common message, and that is competence is the application of skills, knowledge, attitude, training, qualifications applied over time, not in five weeks, not in eight weeks, not in 12 weeks. Now, I watched, you got me going now, I watched a <laughs> video of a certain training company who will never be mentioned because um, I'm just going to say I'm not a fan of any company that runs a short course and says and tells someone that they are going to be an electrician or an electrical installer, you are contributing to the false economy and a danger to society. Mm. There, I've said it. Um, sue me. Um, but I saw a video where one of them, and all it did in the video very subtly was, you will be constantly monitored for competence. You will be regularly assessed. Bollocks. You'll be shown how to do something. You'll be asked to repeat it tick box you'll be taught something in a classroom you'll be asked to pass an exam tick box you then get registered with a card scheme what the fuck so you can go and do an eight-week course and get a certain card in our industry but yet the learners who are in college at havering can't get their grb card because they're not employed by anyone you'd go and do a short course you can get it while you're in a course that learner is going to have far more knowledge in them slowly over time are more passion to want to work than the, than potentially the eight week person and i'm not i'm not kicking the eight week or the five week person we know there are loads of them out there karen boom wonderful lady she did the short course but she was consciously competent enough to realize i can't do this and she's got paul with her who's a fantastic chap i've met him who mentored her and and do you know what she's done served her time applied yeah. knowledge over time and she's gained her confidence and her competence. She's developed, enhanced, bolted on courses. Fantastic success story of someone who's gone in the short course route, put the time in, and mm. grown. Um, yeah. There's, there's too many of them out there who are chancing it. I think I think I ended it. So I said there that learners can binge on the training and they can consume what they can consume, and then and then they can obviously do it over time. But I added here. Most importantly, they can assess their individual competence through that journey. And I put, imagine if learners were trained to utilize CPD at the beginning yes. of their training journey. Yep. So at the beginning of their training journey, they were introduced to CPD resources. And they were then, throughout their training journey, using CPD resources to the point where it actually became a natural habit and liking. So when they completed what you may call a three-year period, they're already inherently motivated enticed or even you know engineered or whatever you want to call it to seek and value cpd i do so many posts and i talk about cpd and electricians go cpd with a question mark still mm. you know um if we can get people to actually encourage the use of cpd whatever the cpd is you know we can recognize cpd to be through you know this could be a, probably another episode of this series alone cpd yeah you know towards I the think end we need I to think. do one yeah i think we need to do one on what is cpd um mm. maybe we do this over on your podcast because you have a podcast as well dave if I anyone's do. listening I do. and i'm Sparky probably ninja has a podcast and as, um as this is training related i might even just rip this onto that podcast as well later on absolutely because yeah. this 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 podcast is owned by everybody including mm. dave um considering he actually taught me <laughs> to do it <laughs> and you're found a member yeah. of e5 so yes absolutely um no, that's that's my that's my experience of FE. Um, FE colleges were tired. You've seen you've seen a couple yourself. Yeah, they were tired. The staffing. There are some passionate members of staff, but there are also some staff that don't really want to change. There are guys who just want to assess, who don't want to train. Guys who only want to train their area. There's a real issue, and some of those colleges, their staffing does need to get shaken around. That's that's that you know there might be a great management system but if they've got the wrong staff, and there might be a great staff system with the bad management, or you might have either of those with no resources. So FE is tired, um, but I do think we can go into this in another probably one of the next ones in this series. We'll well, probably look at awarding bodies, and the awarding bodies do need to obviously get involved in this as well. So I'm going to throw my toys out the pram now. 
Um, I learned something while I was at a college for the IET as a volunteer, and we had to go there and we did a special session um, for the tutors. And it was it was a special CPD session to help the tutors understand and enrich the students, which I thought was amazing. Brilliant. And that's where we bought the test rigs. We showed the tutors, you know, visually hands on stuff, which is what mm. we always try and do. I'll be doing it when I'm down in Exeter next month. Um, but the biggest challenge we found was the tutors would come up to us and they'd go, what's in the current edition of regulations currently isn't in our syllabuses. So yeah, they'll wave the blue book around and they will teach from it. But they're also learning it because the city and guilds are not they're not updating the syllabus and stuff <coughs> enough. And what I'm finding is, is the really passionate tutors <sighs> are creating or. Well, do you know, do you know, the stupid yeah. thing is yeah. tutors at college they you know they're only supposed to work i think like they're only, they're only supposed to do like 25 hours a week or something like that really of teaching the rest must be lesson planning and all of that stuff so they have to do lesson planning they have to do obviously you know build up tear down of practical sessions if they're in the practical area yeah, 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 yeah. but they they they're fixed to work they're fixed not to work so many hours there's a cap i can't remember exactly what it is in my mind because i've never been full-time fe i've only been sessional but yeah they're not allowed to work beyond a certain threshold which means they're forced to have times to lesson plan to do you know all of that stuff that's required including their, their own professional development to make sure they're doing their training so there is there is time to maintain syllabus to update syllabus it's just very lazy but, but we know as well you look at the likes of gary hayers the hours that that man used to work mm. uh, because when we first met him he worked all the hours under the sun and was literally thrown out of the building in tresham yeah. many many a time when we'd go and visit him he was the last person to leave other than the caretaker their their passion made them do such long hours and obviously start their gsh project as well which consumed a lot of time but has done a massive benefit to the industry um i think more colleges are trying to do that they're trying to infuse inspiration and passion into what they're doing so the learners can see it um i just wish more was done for learners and trainers so i'm gonna i'm gonna put it out there i'm just gonna do a big shout out because um i think we're gonna end this now dave um to any of the YouTubers or people who have influence or sway or clients or contractors out there, please, 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 one, do as much as you can to stimulate and help uh, apprentices. And also anything you can do as far as training materials, CPD, inspirational visits, please get out to your local FE colleges um, and just give them a hand. Help them with a visit, a pep talk, cheer them up, give them some real life social skills um and just do what you can because we need to start looking after the industry and hopefully the industry will then start following uh, our lead and start looking properly at looking after the industry because the technology the knowledge that we are going to be required to have holy cow if you look at what's going on in further education and what's coming in amendment yeah. two and the others huge gap again i mean a couple of years ago i had this issue with the 18th edition being a three-day course yeah, you know, and I was saying it should be four day course, the actual, you know, the the guided learning hours, push it to a four and even a fifth day when you actually have the total qualification time. Everyone said, no, 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 it's only three days. If you deliver it properly, it's a bloody struggle to do it in three days. Yeah, it's a bloody struggle. When I deliver it in three days, I have no time for practice exams. Everyone passes with me. No practice exams. Yeah, no yeah. time because I cover the whole syllabus. And, like, and, I did, and, like I did on YouTube. And the thing is, next book, the next published book, is yeah. going to be a lot bigger. Yes, it will. And when it's well, a lot absolutely. bigger, how are they going to get to three days? And that's the thing. Um, Never we've, changes. Got actually, we've got to stop abusing training. Yeah, no, and I agree with you. And, and weirdly enough, um, a friend of mine who was on a training course um, over at a railway, he said to me, he said, oh, I've just been on my AIM edition update. And there was a bloke teaching us. And I went, yeah. And we all sat in the room. And it was like listening to you talk to us for three days. And I went, who's that? And they went, oh, a guy called David Watson. I went, <laughs> small world. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he went, he's just like you. He's really knowledgeable. I went, good. You've had the best, one of the best tutors in the country. Um, right, Dave, I think we'll we'll maybe chip some of these podcasts into your channel. And, well, this is probably on your channel already. So um, stay tuned because we're going to do lots and lots of topics where we look at awarding bodies. I want to talk about exam structures, Dave, advice for courses, how you develop and grow through all the plethora of courses, the numbering system, the whole lot. We want your knowledge. So um, okay. I'm going to thank you for this. All right. We're going to end it now. 
and um, stay tuned for more um, training with Sparky Ninja. Um, mm -hmm. And until the next one, take care of yourself and each other. See you Bye -bye. soon.